It's the savvy side of 9 to 5. Listen. Bueller. 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 Laugh. Ah! And learn. Negotiation. This is what you do in business. This is the Focus Group with Tim Bennett. S T A U N C H. And John Nash. Keep your clothes looking neat and clean. We're all business. Except when we're not. Welcome to the Focus Group. John Nash here coming to you live from New York. And I'm joined, as always, by, with my good friend and co host, Tim Bennett, coming to you live from Philadelphia. As he checks his profile. Is it out. too dark? Do I Do look I need good? To brighten is, the light? Should I take Should is, I take the light off, John? Is the is camera the my friend? Off? Let's see. I don't know if that's going to help. Uh, it's kind of, the, kind of the same. Kind of the same. Yeah. You, you look okay. Right. You look okay. Well, we'll figure it out. You sound fantastic, though, and that's all that really counts. I mean, you know, the pictures were the thousand words, but <laughs> you sound great, and you look good too. Uh, yeah. Hey, we're all business except when we're not, and uh, that's our tagline here on the show. In this this episode, we are a little bit of business and a little bit of not business, and we'll explain that in a second. If you're going to join us uh, on Facebook Live or YouTube, feel free to call in at 877-962-6846. That's our number here in the studio. You'll get the fantastic Garrett on the line. Sitting next to him is John, our video producer, and we have Allie back in the booth as well. This is the crew that brings you the focus group. So, Mr. Bennett, welcome. It's good to see you via uh, the magic of Skype. You sound fantastic. As I said, our, our other producer, Matt's going to be thrilled with the quality of the audio. <laughs> which well, we... the audio would be good, but, you know, Brian, so Brian from AdMark360 came to help me set up because he didn't like the setup last time, although I'm not so sure this is right with the lighting. And, of course, a lot of my lamps have disappeared. So, uh, you know, I'm in a pretty dark house right now. So I don't know. <laughs> But in the spirit of full transparency, because a number of people have been asking, I um, I have a back injury, so that's why I'm not um, in New York. Of course, I prefer to be in studio with everybody, but because of this back injury, we're trying to uh, see if in the short term that this works as a option for us before we uh, before I figure out what's what and that I can get back in back to New York on an easy basis. So thanks, everybody, for helping me set this up. Yeah, my idea and, and Bob's idea is that we want to get these little portable green screen things and we could put one behind Tim and and we could always put different pictures behind him. Maybe he's at the Kentucky Derby. Maybe he's at, you know, a rowing event. <laughs> Maybe he's visiting the Smithsonian. It could be kind of a, a fun little twist on the whole thing. You know, your the picture always changes. Well, Brian did have a green screen, but I thought let's let's try to get this audio figured out first and then we can worry about all the all the pretty stuff. So Well look, I'm gonna say it, you sound fantastic. Fantastic. And the last time you came in via Skype uh, was one of the Nor'easters, and we were relying on the laptop microphone. This sounds like you're. Does it sound better? It sounds like you're sitting right next to me. I wish you were, but it sounds just as good. Oh, there you go. All right. So uh, we want to thank everybody who uh, found have been listening to our other podcast, Unbuttoned. It's part of the same stream, but it's a, a, a show that we put out on Tuesday mornings. It's about 18 to 20 minutes long. It's a spontaneous and immediate, no holds barred look at politics, pop culture, and more often than not, whatever comes to our mind. So thanks for uh, putting that on your feed and downloading and listening. It's been doing very well. Um, on the show today, two things. We have a shop talk about Carnival Cruise and Bermuda, which was fascinating. And then later on, we're re welcoming Chef Michael Greco, who's the owner of Julietta's on Carmine Street here in New York. And he... <laughs> Did you like my little... Julietta's. To Julietta's. Well, you know... <laughs> you're unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, I know. You, you just, you're, you're like one of those SNL skits that's, that's true to life. You, 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 you got to do the, the whole the whole shtick. At, at least I'm not... I don't want to be Stuart Smalley, and I'm not so sure. Who is the guy that does the He Comes On Weekend Update? Bill Hader used to play him. And he, Stefan... You don't. Oh, yeah. you, you don't want to be. You, you don't want to. You want to be somewhere in the middle of those two characters if you're a character. <laughs> anyway, Chef, Chef Michael Greco will be here talking about a interesting signature thing they have going out at the restaurant with something called a sham bong. Now we heard about it. I my mind immediately went to you know I know what a bong is and I wasn't quite sure what a sham bong was and I wondered if that was just a way to filter smoke maybe you put right. champagne in your bong and it does something fantastic to the to the stuff that you happen to be the tobacco product you may be smoking <laughs> now were the kids in school when you were in college did they use mostly bongs or did they use uh just smoke a joint 
Oh, it was 50-50. Um, yeah. I felt that the, uh, I'll put it to you this way, as a friend of mine once said to me, he goes, the more sophisticated dorm, room, dorm rooms had water pipe equipment to filter the smoke, the less sophisticated ones uh, rolled a joint. However, the skill of doing the, the rolled uh, thing is still something that eludes me to this day, and I do admire it in others. So someone who could do it in a, in a high wind in particular is fantastic, or even just lighting one in a high wind. Well, this is a liquor thing from what we gather, so it'll yeah. be interesting to see. You're going to get to taste it, I guess. Yeah, they're going to bring some samples of some of the Chambon cocktails that are available to us. So, um, all good down there? Yeah, so yesterday, John, I went to um, I was I went to get an MRI for my back. So I went into the hospital, and I, I particularly wore what I called Homeland Security approved clothing. <laughs> I so love I this story. To, I love this story. <laughs> so I wouldn't have to change anything out. So I had on like these pajama pants, and I had on no metal, no zippers, no anything. I, I looked a little odd on the streets. I thought, but anyway, I'm hobbling along, and uh, I go into the MRI um, machine. You know, it's a tube they put you in. And the woman looks at my shoes and I said, oh, these are just rubber and, and cloth or some Chinese <laughs> shoe that I bought at Primark. They'll be fine. It's just a slip on. She goes, oh, yeah, it feels great. Looks great. So I jump on the MRI machine. She gives me this little ball and says, hey, if something doesn't feel right or something's wrong, hit this little ball. Start, you know, let it alert us. So as we're going and I've had MRIs before for numerous things. And I'm lying there and all of a sudden my feet start shaking and I can feel the magnet yanking at my feet which is not supposed to happen. You know, it's a huge magnet in these MRI machines. And uh, if you have any metal or implants or anything, it could be dangerous. So I'm afraid now that it's gonna grab my feet and just throw them up against the, throw it up against the, um, the MRI machine. So I started squeezing the ball. We couldn't figure out, we looked at the shoes again, we figured, I don't know if the Chinese use some kind of metal thread. I don't know what the issue was, but for whatever, for whatever reason, these shoes are magnetic. Well, the minute you took them off, were you able to just Fine. complete the MRI? You know, yeah, right. I had my focus group radio socks on. They didn't get, they didn't attract the magnet. <laughs> well, they attracted the eye of the radiologist, but not the magnet. You know. <laughs> was it a male or female radiologist? It was a, it was a male. He was a, a younger, very tall. Um, I'm guessing Asian guy. You know, I'll, I'll profile, but he was very tall. I remember very tall, dark hair, young. It would have been yep. really funny if he said, hey, I watched, I, I listened to that show you got those socks on from. And then he yeah. could have just smiled and said, I am the show. I am the show. I'm Mr. Tim Bennett. That only happened to me once, and Brian couldn't believe it. We went looking at a house. It was in New Hope, Pennsylvania one time, and the realtor came out. And she, you would have loved her because she, her first language was French. And uh, she got out, and I said, hi, I'm Tim Bennett. And she stops me right away. She goes, oh, my God, you do a list. <laughs> so... I said, yeah, and she goes, I listen on the radio. I said, you listen to Al-Q on the radio? But she, you know, married woman uh, with kids, so you never know who was listening back then. But she recognized her from the list. Brian was dying. He couldn't believe it. I said, well, <laughs> she couldn't have made that up. <laughs> I remember one time you and I were in San Francisco staying in the Tenderloin area. Um, after we stepped over many of the homeless on the way to the diner we ate at, um, we were having the a camp. Yeah, the meth camp. And it literally was. There was a pup tent, two or three pup tents. People were just kind of like set up on the sidewalk in a weird yeah. way. So we're at this diner, and you and I are having a quiet conversation. But as usual, uh, me and Tim really do delight in making each other laugh. So he, Tim tells me this story, which I had not heard before, and I bust out laughing. And about two minutes later, this guy walks up to the table and goes, Hey, I don't mean to interrupt your, your breakfast, but... He goes, are you John Nash and Tim Bennett from the focus group? And we're like, oh, my God, yeah, we are. You know, how, how'd you know? And he just he just smiled. He goes, it was John's laugh that gave it away. So, And another time in Florida, somebody spotted us for arguing. Remember, we were arguing and we were arguing in a, in a hotel lobby about something. And they're like, oh, my God, you guys are from the radio. And we're like, yeah. So, but that hasn't happened recently, has it, John? No. We and, haven't been and, traveling. And, and Tim, was that, was that Lauderdale Pride? Wilton Manors, baby. Wilton Manors, when the hurricane came through and uh, we barely got a 40-minute show out of that one because the bar we were recording at served us Long Island iced teas. No one showed up. A drag queen that was dressed as Lucille Ball did provide a lot of amusement for us because you love Lucy and so do I. But by an hour into this broadcast, like this remote we were doing from Wilton Manors, you just looked at me at one point and go, this is off the rails. We'll rescue it in New York. 
and we did in fact rescue the show later. I don't know how we did it, but that was a crazy weekend. That was a crazy weekend. Well, that was all your idea. <laughs> and I'll have you note that I was okay. I went with the flow, but I knew I knew it was going to be a train wreck, and it was. <laughs> from the minute the plane landed, and the guy Lord forgot Lord. to pick us up. He was strung he went the, out. He went the wrong drunk. way on the highway, and I said, "Hey, this is a new way to go to Lauderdale." And he said, "Oh my God!" And he literally turned this car onto the median between the the you know west on a major and, highway on a major highway. Bum 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 bum. The thing go, and he drives up onto the next side, and we're like, "What about other cars and trucks?" You're in the back seat, clinging on for your dear life. I'm kind of laughing in the front until we get to and then remember he, when he parked the car at the hotel we were staying at you couldn't get out because he parked like a quarter inch away from a dumpster <laughs> and i remember you going through as and he was so uninterested you were going through the list of all the guests we had on the show and how wonderful the show is and he was he was so strung out and even when we saw somebody later they said he picked you up at the airport <laughs> That's when you knew our life was in someone else's hands, and we didn't even know it at the time. We're like, oh, my God. I knew it right away, but you were too busy to having a chat with him up front, and I was like, this is a this is bad. You know, you know, anyway. you, you know, gang in the booth, this is very strange because this feels like Tim's here. The audio quality is so good, and he looks, he looks okay on the video, but I'm being berated, so it's kind of like he's here, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> nothing's changed. <laughs> nothing's changed. But, Tim, thank, I will... Thank you, John, in the booth for being so patient with me setting up. Oh, my pleasure, Tim, of course. It was a all breeze. That's oh, all and honestly, you did great, Tim. It was. it was all I you. I did. Thank you. One attempt, success. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> one to, and done. To our to our fan base and listeners, uh, Tim is. Before we little... went on the air, if you could have seen John's face of aggravation and ah, from how breathing, throwing the phone down, the whole thing, settle down. Well, you know what? I, I, in other words, I should take a page out of John, John Booth John's rule book for how to deal. Because I did listen carefully to how he patiently walked you through first the system preferences, then the Skype preferences. You know me, Tim. I just assume everybody knows this stuff. So. And of course, there's my stupid phone of all things. It doesn't <laughs> ring all day. I don't and hear I it. Guess no more robos don't worry, working. Tim. I don't hear it. Wait, we don't really no. hear it because you're on the mic, and the mic is good at keeping things no. uh, directional. So, well. what caught your eye this week? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. So, interestingly, this, this headline that caught my eye was one that I thought was right up your alley, John. <laughs> I think we each picked one for each other, but go ahead. It says, for sale, 40 life-size Amish, or as my dad used to say, Amish, <laughs> figures from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. <laughs> I want one. Oh, my God. Look at well, them. They're, so they're for sale, John. They're on Craigslist. Are they wax so figures? They're wax figures. So there was a wax museum in Lancaster County, PA. And uh, it was part of this whole big Dutch wonderland. Um, you got a pretzel at the end of the ride, right? Well, th that was one of the tableaus. It was a tableau with all these Amish or Amish. And uh, so right outside of Dutch wonderland was this wax museum. And they had people like Ben Franklin and some other historical figures. And then they had different tableaus with the Amish doing barn raising, pretzel making, you know, all the things they do. <laughs> so <laughs> I love this. I so love the beards over. and the hats. Oh, my God. Well, so Dana DeChico, she's selling them. She says, you know, when she was a little girl, so it's her uncle's collection, when she was a little girl, they didn't seem creepy. She says, but now, eh, maybe she looks at them. They might be a little soulless, a little creepy. So um, as I said, their first sale, the, the museum had opened in the late 60s. And new people have since purchased Dutch Wonderland in 2006, and they didn't want anything to do with any of the wax figures. They were going to do a big, big scene of them barn raising again. They said no. And uh, they said um, a lot of the other figures, as I said, were sold off, but these um, Amish figures were not. And so, for instance, Ben Franklin at the Wax Museum sold for $4,100, and the mayor of Lancaster sold for $550. But um, so each of the figures... <laughs> I'm He's sorry. Just, you can't. Look at the eyes. Yeah, I Tim, I think that these these are you got to and you can't just buy one. You kind of have to have more than one to complete the tableau, right? Well, no serious offer will be turned down, John. The the um they stand 5 foot 5 inches about and they uh some are mechanical. So some move 
It said, and I love this description. DeChico says, the one with the beard and the hat can speak. Well, which one? They're, all the Amish have beards and hats. <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing through your segment, but this is, Tim, okay. this is, if this place had been opened, this would have been a road trip destination. This is hysterical. Well, so there, as I said, there's various sizes. The wardrobe can be exchanged to suit your historical or theatrical needs. There's five female figures, three children. 32 males and one dog. Five of the males are mechanical. The dog is mechanical as well. They're in a various state of condition, they said. The, um, the parts are removable. Some can be disassembled. The, uh, the anatomic or the ones that move are going for $1,500. The full-size adults for $350. The dog and the children for $300. Just... So, far, so far, no one's buying. So they're listed on Craigslist. <laughs> And uh, they, tr they contacted John Oliver because a month earlier, the Gettysburg Wax Museum went out of business. And Stephen Colbert and Rachel Maddow both bought President Zachary Tyler or Taylor and Dwight Eisenhower. And John Oliver bought Nixon, Clinton, Carter, and William Henry Harrison. So they've contacted John Oliver to see if he has interest in the Amish. They don't appear to think so. He says... Uh, the woman says she's thinking that they look so bad because they're in bad lighting. So she says, I don't think they're that creepy. It's just bad lighting. So I, you know, I could have been Amish, I think. <laughs> How did you draw the line from the wax doll to you could have been Amish? Well, what do you do? You plant a garden, you ride a buggy, you raise a bar, and you eat a pie. I don't mean, it, it, don't forget fight. churning your own butter, mending yep. your clothes, right? No electricity. I have a proposal. My dad just threaten us about that. My what if, what if we right what if we bought two of these Amish wax dolls and you had one sitting next to you on the show and I had one next to me all the time and you could you could figure them so they're looking straight ahead with that eerie kind of like uh, you know glance. Hall of Presidents and Disney World soulless glance and they would never react they'd be non-reactive characters we'd be laughing and talking but they would just well we'd have to buy the dog I think oh the dog is a must yeah I think you'd get the dog but would you get the would you get a male figure or would you get the females. You know, only five females. The the male ones are hilarious because of the beards and the hats. Uh, yeah. Although, I, so I might go male. I might go a male and a dog, and then so the dog could sit on your your desk, and I'm at your desk because Garrett calls us the big boy chair, the big boy seat. I, I had no idea it had a name. It's a big boy. I told my mom that, and I, she, I laughed. I said one of our producers, Garrett, calls the big boy seat. She goes, "Oh, I think that's what they called that at the barber shop when you got your first haircut, or something, <laughs> something like that, the booster seat, or something." Well, I'll check, John, to see what's available. If you're really serious, I mean, I, we I, get to some I am. They're not. They're not big sellers. People, they're trying to sell them to. There's a place called Field of Screams, which is this corn maze <laughs> out in Burdenhand, and they're thinking they might put them there and the for Halloween to scare people in the corn maze, but. <laughs> You know, you just can't make this up. They're they're planning on field. What is it called? Field of screams. Field of screams. Field I of screams. boy, I love America. I love it every day. I, that that is too classic. Where did you find this, by the way? Oh my God, it's been all over. It's uh, so it, it was in the Philadelphia newspaper or the here the Philadelphia dot com, but it's been in the New York Daily News. It's been on Huffington Post. It's mental. Uh, a, website called Mental Floss, because I, I, it was, again, one of those things where I said, let me check to make sure this is a real story. And so I started poking around, and all these different um, different versions of the story came up. I mean, the lines are hilarious. I mean, they've interviewed these people, and, and uh, they're really upset about the fact that no one seems to have interest in history anymore, and no one understands the importance of, of doing these tableaus of, of Americana. I love it because I think it's so campy, but... Um, you know, we'll see. I'll check it out and see if they still have any available. They said they're 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 on fa on a Craigslist. It's going to, you know, they're going to have a bunch of these people left and it's going to be a fight. We're going to sweep swoop in and fire sale prices will dominate. And the focus group will, in fact, have a mechanical dog and uh, an Amish mechanical an Amish. dog. Will they let us keep them up there at, uh, at the studio. They might end up being on other shows. They could be they could be forever props. Like a forever stamp, you know, good Let's on an envelope. What do the Amish have to say? What do the Amish <laughs> think about what's going on? <laughs> then you, right then the camera just goes to the Amish person, like, you know, or the mouth moves or something. Oh. All right. What caught my eye is for you. So you you got one for me, which, by the way, I love. Thank you. I love this this Amish thing. Is just Amish Amish. 
I, I used to say Amish too, by the way. I'm Did like you your, really? I'm like your dad. Yeah. So your dad oh, and I are joking. more I didn't know you really more alike than not. Um, so my what caught my eye was something that you talk about a great deal. I talk about it as well. It's this annoying robo calls. Even when you have so many many moons ago, Tim turned our listeners on to something called Nomo Robo, primarily for a landline. You actually register your phone, and people just are not allowed to make you know calls to you. But the once they just switch the number and they get through, yeah. and I still and every day I get at least five times the phone will ring once, and that's the phone company saying. If it doesn't ring anymore, the one ring means that was a scammer or that was stupid. Some, I'll pick up often, and, and there'll be a long pause, and there'll be a voice that will say, oh, hi, I want to talk to you about your credit card rate. Just uh, the other day, I picked up the phone, and a woman goes, oh, hello, it's so good to hear a friendly voice. The last woman I talked to was worse than my mother-in-law. How are you doing today? I hope you're going to be uh, able to help the kids with cancer. I thought it was real, and she prattles on for a bit and then she said will you be making a donation by check or by mail and i think i said the words Jeez. cotton i said like cotton candy and she goes okay let me put you through to my supervisor so i thought wait a minute it, it sounded so good so the supervisor gets on she was a robot as well she goes what, what credit card will we be using and i said it, was, it came from the the uh, captain kangaroo club okay why don't you give me the number <laughs> so i just hang, i just hung up the phone i thought but it, they had me for at least four minutes okay long-winded way of getting to this thing so there is a new app available called robo killer at its core the app is just another spam blocker when someone calls you from one of the 200,000 numbers it has stored as spam your phone won't ring you'll get a notification later saying that the call was blocked. But what makes this different than other apps is that rather than just prevent the call from coming through, RoboKiller answers the call using a series of pre-recorded messages that are designed to make the caller think you're talking to a real person. Oh, I love that. In other words, you're wasting their time now, okay? Now, the app is not free. It's a subscription that runs $2.99 a month or $24.99 annually. That said, if you're someone who constantly gets bombarded with calls, that the cost might be worth it. Um, so I want to try it out, actually, uh, because I would love to have one of these. You do it all the time. You pick up the phone. You actually engage the road. Oh, I do all the time, yeah. I think I'm on a do call list. <laughs> on a do call list. <laughs> So the article goes on to say that uh, AT&T and Verizon both offer call blocking apps. I don't really know about that. I tried to check that out. And there's also something called Trap Call is a decent choice for smartphones. Uh, there are more options. I've never heard of Trap Call either. Uh, and then, there, of course, there's Nomo Robo for landline. So this thing, again, is called Robo Killer. And it's $2.99 a month. And it's an app that you download. And it intercepts. I find personally that more and more unsolicited calls are coming through to my cell phone than the landline. And that was never the case about a year yeah. ago. But but now I get at least four or five calls a day, numbers I have no idea. And they're they're close to my zip code, my uh, area code, too. So I think I might know who it is, but it doesn't say a contact name. So so there you go. No, that's the scary thing with those is that you do it. Because I had two today that got by the Nomo Robo. And they use sometimes they even mask your own number and have your own number come in. So... Um, <laughs> But I know I try to engage them. I remember back in the day we talked about different ways of people engaging them. And there's always this scam about if you have the computer, go to your computer, you have a virus, which uh, I've told my mom to not fall for, of course, and some other people. But it's uh, it's scary. I but, did that um, once with one of the computer guys. He calls up. He said, I'm calling about your, um, your, win PC. your Windows laptop. Yeah. And I said, OK. He yep. said, I want you to go to this. And, and after about four or five minutes, I said, you know, you know, um, the start menu on my my laptop is a little Apple. I said it's not. I said it doesn't look like you're describing. He goes, oh no 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 no, like furiously hangs up because he knew I was an Apple guy. So that's how it worked. All right, so that was what caught our eye. Well, let's do a, a business birthday. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. So uh, celebrating, well, he wouldn't celebrate today. He's dead, but he was born April 4th. <laughs> but he's dead. All right. In 1821, the poor man died Christmas Day at 47 years old of a heart attack. But Linus Yale Jr. is an American mechanical engineer and manufacturer and co-founder of the Yale Lock Manufacturing Company. He's best known for his inventions of locks, especially the cylinder lock. His basic design is still widely distributed today. 
and constitutes a majority of the personal locks and safes that we have. I remember as a kid, you wanted to have a Yale lock, didn't you, John? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yale was the lock standard. And one of his big, there, there's there's probably too much that I care to go into about uh, all the wonkiness of the locks and how he made them and why they were different. But essentially the thought was a lot of locks that had keys or holes in them back in the 1800s and early 1900s could be um, easily picked and or you could have gunpowder put in them and blow them up or so forth and so on. So he did this cylinder sort of thing that um, that would prevent most of that. And then all the dials and everything he used um, were different in that you wouldn't even need a key so that there were no holes anywhere within the lock so that you wouldn't be able to blow them up. So he's been in the uh, he's related to the family that started Yale University. Why are you laughing? I'm just smiling. Laughing? Well, I'm smiling because oh. I love these kinds of birthdays because he's he's it's mechanical. It, yeah. it it had to be figured out, made, manufactured, tested, and it's a small it's a small little thing. It's kind of cool. He's done he's done a bunch of other inventions as well, but mostly mechanical and enge, on the engineering side. Do you want to know where the first key operated lock concept was conceived? How long ago and where it was? You being a historian might know this. Mm, I, I, I want to say it might have been either Egypt, e Egyptian times or Greek times, but I'm probably wrong. It might be Roman. No, does Jeopardy go with your first guess? Egypt. Egypt. Four okay. Go with your first. Yes. Yeah, see, that's the, that's the rule of Jeopardy. 4,000 years ago, at, uh, Egypt was the, actually the first um, culture that utilized the key operated lock concept. It goes through a whole bunch of other reasons. It really gets into the weeds about how he invented the locks and why with his family and his, his dad. But let's just say he built a better mousetrap and it's still used today, it's still relevant and used today. And he died at 47, which even at that time period was a rather young, that's, that's kind of young, right? Yeah, he was on his way to, it says, um, he was on his way to uh, make a big deal with a, a group of uh, skyscrapers in Manhattan, they said. And uh, on his way there in the car, he died of a heart attack. Wow. Said so he was on his way to New York. I'm sorry, it wasn't a car. He was on a business trip to New York City in 1868, and he died suddenly of a heart attack while regist while negotiating to have the locks installed in a number of skyscrapers that were going to be built in Manhattan. And uh, they ended up obviously putting them in, but um, he never saw the day. But yeah, young at 47. Yeah, 47 was young even by that standard. Yeah. Hey, uh, as many of you know, Deep Discount is a partner of ours here on the Focus Group. Start your shopping experience with them by going to focusgroupradio.com. Click on the shark logo on the right, Arr, the Deep Discount logo, and begin. We'd like you to go that way because we get credit for it. They've been with us for over a year now. We love working with Deep Discount. They have a fun marketing team, and me and Tim love movies and TV. I, unabashedly, I'm just going to confess that I'm a media whore. Well, I'm a selective media whore, and Tim is extremely selective, but has very overly selective. Very interesting taste Tim has. Okay, so this week over at deepdiscount.com is the Blu-ray sale. Blu-rays look fantastic. I'm a big fan of Blu-ray media and or the 4K Ultra HD. Blu-ray in particular, though, and the 4K pack a lot of extra specials into the, the disc because they could put extra documentaries, behind-the-scenes stuff. So most titles you probably love are available on Blu-ray, and I picked one. I think Tim picked one as well. Uh, I picked one that I think everybody, every library should have, frankly, and that is Casino, starring Robert De Niro, Sharon Stone, Joe Pesci, directed by Martin Scorsese. Do we need to say anything more than that? I, I have watched Casino a number of times. I, in fact... I think I lost count. It's a really well done film. Now, um, back when we were on Sirius Satellite Radio, we used to play a game called Pick That Flick. And I remembered I had a, an audio snippet from Casino available. Yeah. yeah, and John's gonna play it. it it's this scene where um, Robert De Niro is talking to one of the chefs of the hotel about blueberries. How long can this go on? From now on, I want you to put an equal amount of blueberries in each muffin. An equal amount of blueberries in each muffin. You know how long that's going to take? I don't care how long it takes. Put an equal amount in each muffin. <laughs> I miraculously, when we, were on the, when we were on the old platform, a number of people got that, that clue and they called in and said it was Casino. So my pick is Casino from the Blu-ray sale. Tim, what'd you pick? Well, I'm almost embarrassed of what I picked. I remember my cousin back in the day having this and I thought it was very taboo. It's called Chesty Morgan's Bosom Buddies Triple Feature on Blu-ray. <laughs> Have you ever heard of this? 
Oh, OMG in the vernacular of the day. No, I have not. This is this is like, like a three pack of three movies or something. Yeah, it's more for John and Garrett in the booth. This woman has natural 73 inch size breasts. And um, she, she did a number of cult movies in the 70s. It reminded me a little bit of and I want to get this because I think you and Bob coming down and us watching this with a bunch of friends, almost like a mystery science theater sort of thing would be hilarious. It's, it reminds me a little bit of the same cultiness of Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. Kill Kill, like a Russ Meyer. But what she does is she kills people with her breasts. So she <laughs> smothers them. She, you know, they'll go in at her and then she'll wrap the, she'll choke them. She'll strangle them with these breasts. And uh, I was looking at some of the trailer and I thought, again, I like picking things. You're not going to find this anywhere else. You're not going to find this on on your cable system as you're flipping through, but you can get it at deep discount. So I picked that. This one comes, it's under 20 bucks. I think it's only $16. And it comes, the three movies are Deadly Weapons, Double Agent 73, and The Immoral Three. <laughs> and Double deadly Agent, they actually- Deadly they actually, Weapons. Right, that one is where she kills and chokes them with her 73 inch breasts. And the Double Agent 73, they actually hide a camera implanted in her breast, they say, and also a bomb. So she's booby trapped, ha ha ha. <laughs> and then um, and then the other one, she's got three daughters that uh, they're out to avenge a killer. But it's a, it's a cult erotica, came out in 75. There really is no nudity. You know, you see, so in a lot of the trailer or whatever, you can see the, it's imagination. You'll see backsides or whatever. You never actually really see her full breasts. All right, but all right. It's hilarious, I think. So now, anyway, I think when, that when you when you were prepping the show, did and you were at the deep discount section of the prep time, did did you yeah. actually search for this? No. So what I did is I went through. I, I always try to. I go through everything. So this is the Blu-ray sale. You you had alerted me to the Blu-ray sale. So I went to the link, and then what I do is I go to the very end. I never look. You go to the last page. I go to the last page, and of course, here we found Chesty Morgan. <laughs> so I like your style. I like because your I style. like I like going back. It reminds me. of, remember Dennis Dermody used to be on the Frank DeCaro show talking movies. So this reminded me of that sort of kind of just hilarious nonsense cult classic. I think it'd be fun for us to sit with a bunch of friends. You sit and you just laugh and make comments, and you know, it's just a. Something you're, I, they could never make movies like this no, now. Right? No, and and Tim, you've you've just encapsulated the perfect reason and the for the argument of owning packaged media and buying stuff from deep discount. You tell me the streaming service you're going to find this on. Nope. It's not on Hulu. It ain't on Netflix, and I can guarantee you it's not on Amazon Prime. Um, I could be proven wrong, but I strongly think I I, I suspect I'm right. So. Uh, the new release this week, by the way, speaking of the movies from the 70s, so she was, that was 72 or something you said, the Chesty? Yeah, it um, it actually came out in, it was, re original year it was released as 75. It was re-released in 2012. Okay, it's so. On, it, it's on deep discount. So a new release this week uh, coming to us from the 70s, but obviously remastered for Blu-ray, is a Charles Bronson four-movie collection. Now, I saw this and I thought, you know, Charles Bronson is one of those actors who really in fact was very defined by that the decades he worked in primarily the 70s and i looked at the movies that were available it's four movies on this disc two of them were actually on multiple charles bronson top 10 lists because I, I looked at about five different top 10 lists and two of them were always consistently there on numbers and reverse order seven on the list or seven or eight usually was something called the Valachi papers and it's Bronson playing Joe Valachi, a real life stool pigeon who spilled his guts about the inner workings of the mafia. And it follows his sordid life. And it ends with a, a real life clip of, of Valachi going into federal prison or working, you know, working with the agents. And another one, which is known as one of his best movies, uh, is something called Hard Times from 1976, I think it is. Right. And it's basically this thing about people who do bare knuckle fighting and so i wrote down in my notes here is this fight club before fight club <laughs> well what i what i wrote in my notes was it says it's the um the perfect charles bronson movie for people who claim not to either like him or his movies and um so i said i thought that would be one for me because i have to confess i've not watched a lot of charles bronson have you no and in fact, when I was reading the top 10 list, this one, Hard Times, they talked a lot about how expertly choreographed it was in the fight scenes and how films that have been made since 
that involved fist fights or, or, or action stuff like that have often referenced this director's Walter Hills, the director, uh, his use of choreography and camera work to capture a brutal fight that wasn't probably brutal, but it was the editing and the and the staging that made it look so so gutsy right. and real. So that's uh, so our deep discuss. What was your your first pick? Was Casino? Casino is a must for every collection in Blu-ray. Yeah, the the new release is the Branson four movie uh, four movie collection, and I picked Chesty Morgan's Bosom Buddies triple feature set on Blu-ray. I don't know. We'll see. So head over to uh, the head over to focusgroupradio.com and click on the deep discount logo because we like to get credit for it, and then start shopping away on the uh, the deep discount Blu-ray sale. Right, Garrett? Thanks, deep discount. So, hey, it's Tim Bennett and John Nash. I'm in Philadelphia. John and the gang is up in New York City. And uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to uh, we have a little shop talk. We're going to talk about Carnival Cruise and what's going on with uh, Bermuda's uh, repeal of same sex marriage. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Brought to you by Volkswagen. Visit VW.com to learn more. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with the Focus Group. Try, really try. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. I never try anything. I just do it. Welcome back to the Focus Group. John Nash here in New York City. And my co-host and good friend Tim Bennett is coming to us live from Philadelphia. Before we do our shop talk, we're going to go to Don in Alabama, who has a uh -oh. question for Tim that actually just made me laugh during the break, laugh out loud. So, Don, welcome, and what do you have for Tim today? Hi, Tim. Uh, so how is life in a cave in witness protection? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so last time when I did this during the Nor'easter, I had this old step and repeat that, um, that John uh -huh. and I had used when we'd done events. And so Brian, our friend at Admark 360, is like, oh, no, no, your background was all wrong. Now, he's following along on Facebook right now, so he can chime in if you're following at uh, Focus Group Radio on Facebook. But so he came here with this huge photographer's backdrop and banners and all this stuff. Well, we put it all up in my office, and I said, well, why, just, why can't I just use my yellow walls behind me in my office with my pictures? It's not uniform. It's a mess, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so he sets all this up, and then... The sun was out. Now it's pouring rain down here. And I have these mm -hmm. lights on in the room, but it's dark. So I do. Yes, you're right. I feel like a little Charlie Rose, a little in a cave. But I don't know. It should be brighter. You're right. I, 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 Don, I, so I still I still love with. witness protection. I love that. Yeah. That's uh -huh. very. And you said today's an anniversary, a, a NASA anniversary. Yes, today is, uh, let's see, about two and a half hours ago, uh, April 4th of uh uh, 1968, the Apollo 6 test platform was launched from Cape Canaveral. The Apollo 6 test platform. So was this when yeah, they the were, Apollo, were they the testing the, the was, lunar module dock up? Is that what they were doing? Well, that, this was the last unmanned Saturn V rocket launch. It carried the, the full cargo weight, so it included uh, the limb. And this is when they, this is one of the Missions where they had, I believe it was 26 consecutive failures during our systems failures during launch, but the ship still worked. And then they lost two engines on the second stage. They had an oscillation, a near failure oscillation in the uh, first stage booster engines. So it's one of those things that the machine was so well built that it survived its own effort to tear itself apart. Yeah, you're, you're talking about the amazing ability that NASA built into a lot of our space hardware of re multiple redundancies. I think I learned that mm -hmm. in school at some point. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so, hey, Don, I... Oh, go sorry, ahead, Tim. Don. I have a quick question for you. I was being uh, infirmed. I was been reading more than, uh, than usual, and I read this story about the Hubble telescope that just spotted the... The first time we've seen this star, it's the furthest star we've ever seen. Did yeah. you read that story? Yeah, it's and the, uh, one of the, or the oldest object in the universe that we've seen thus far. And what, it, what, just, what my big takeaway was as a layman in all this was that it said the light has took 9 billion years to get to Earth. Correct. Well, that, is that, I mean, how do you even, 9 billion years? 
That's a long way away. Yeah, well, I, I'm wrapping yeah. my head around my age, let alone nine billion years. <laughs> well, re so. re remember that, that the new term now is we refer to the visible universe as only being approximately 13 billion years old. Wow. 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 All right, so, so that star is very old then. <laughs> yeah, so we, we date the Big Bang to approximately 13 billion. Now, there's a new tool that's actually being built here in Huntsville called the Webb Telescope that if it manages to get launched <clears throat> will be... It's eight times larger than Hubble. So it's a, it's a four-fold order of magnitude more powerful because it has a variable geometry mirror. It will be able to see, in theory, 12 billion, 500 million years back. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and yeah. I can't even remember like when I was four years old. So this is... <laughs> and I can't find my great-grandparents on Ancestry.com. There you go. It's the little things of a modern life, but we can we can age the universe. Hey, Don, thank you for your call today. And I love your comment about witness protection for Tim down there in Philadelphia. Have a good show, guys. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so we have a quick John, shop. You're going to have to come stylized. You're going to have to come stylized. Oh, no, no, Brian, I thought your yellow walls and pictures were fine, by the way. It, it's character. Uh, Brian's like a right on the die, isn't he? Yeah. So yeah, uh, we're going to do a quick shop talk, and then we're going to be welcoming Chef Michael Greco and the Chambon, which we talked about at the beginning of the program. I think this is going to be very fun. Uh, News out of Bermuda, and it concerns Carnival Cruise Lines, parent company to Cunard and P&O Cruises. So uh, February 7th, the Bermuda legislature or commons or whatever they call it, they're, they're like the House of Commons in London. They passed a law rescinding or rolling back same-sex marriage. But what they've done is they've allowed the same rights to be granted to gay couples. They just don't call it marriage. Now, the uh, many gay groups down in Bermuda call it a separate but equal status under the law. But basically, they can't. no gay marriage can be performed anymore in Bermuda. And because Carnival has their ships registered as part of the Bermuda, I think that's how this works, they can no longer, on any of their cruise ships in any part of the world, conduct a same-sex wedding ceremony. And that was interesting because they lease out their cruise ships to RSVP, to Atlantis. They, they have gay couples travel on cruise ships all the time. It doesn't have to be a special cruise. So they finally kind of broke down and they're joining forces with the, the local um, Out Bermuda group that is this fighting this. I thought it was kind of interesting because it's once again, Tim, I wrote down another case of business needing to step in to do the right thing. Right, but they were, it sounds like they were a little slow. The last paragraph where it says their decision to join, so Carnival's decision to join without Bermuda came after the company's CEO originally said on March 22nd he would leave the decision to boycott up to cruise guests. So I was like, is this a conflicting point of view? Now he's decided, well, maybe we will will join in and decide. But I, I did a little bit of research because you and I talked about this um, prior to the show of the fact that Bermuda is part of the British Commonwealth and are they, do they have to abide by, by British law? And it was interesting. Apparently, this has been a big topic in the House of Commons. It came up uh, in Parliament and Bermuda has the right to self-govern itself and the only jurisdiction that the UK really has over Bermuda, according to what I read, is just simply an external affairs and defense. Okay, okay. See, but, see, that would explain why in London the House of the, the Parliament was silent on this issue when yeah. Bermuda did. That explains that then. Okay. Well, they said they've held a number of discussions about it, and a lot of the a lot of the representatives um, in the government, uh, the British government, have been going after the Theresa May's government. How come you're not doing something? Why aren't we saying something about this? And they said that you know, while it's part of the Commonwealth, they are they don't have. They said their laws in Bermuda are stricter than those in any of the other Commonwealth countries, really, other than maybe um, some of the Asian um, territories that they had. And they said a lot of Americans make the mistake when they go to Bermuda, they think they're going to be under laws similar to the UK, like you would have in Canada or Australia, New Zealand. And they said, in fact, no, they're very, very strict. And they adhere more to the European Union form of law. And so that's why when they got rid of same-sex marriage and just did this Domestic Partnership Act, they said that adheres to more of what Europe has. And so that they didn't break any jurisdiction there in terms of 
discrimination, but they didn't feel they feel marriage should be between a man and a woman. Okay, uh, I, I, and that that explains that that the, you and I were confused by that that right. point of British law. I'll conclude this segment by saying that. Uh, Justin Nelson from the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce commented on this and said that 80% of American of LGBT Americans own a passport, whereas 40% of the rest of the population here in the U.S. has a passport. So, just from a sheer and he estimates the the world travel the worldwide travel spend for the LGBT community community to be about a hundred billion dollars. So, it, it's in it. it at one point you say, okay, it's in economic, the economic interest of Carnival to kind of figure this problem out because this could turn away business. And it's not going to turn away $100 billion, but it's going to certainly turn away something, right? Right. Yeah, the other odd part I thought about the whole Bermuda law when I was reading, and I don't know, I, I didn't do enough research on it perhaps, but it said there was only a half a dozen marriages performed between yeah. legalization and um, in the repeal. So who knows? I don't know. I, I again, it's um, it's a sort of thing where if you wanted to get married on a ship and they don't want to do it, um, they don't want to perform the ceremony, then, you know, I would find another ship. <laughs> get me off this thing. I got to get married. Right? Get me on a, yeah. a Viking cruise. All right. So is that uh, that's you ready? To, are you ready to taste your shambong? We're ready for shambong time. Yeah. Great. So we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we've got uh, Chef Michael Greco. And I don't know if there's any other people there. John will have to fill us in when we come back. And uh, John's going to get to try something called a shambong. So uh, stay with us. Brought to you by Volkswagen. Visit VW.com to learn more. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with The Focus Group. And in business a week, I got more money than I know what to do with. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. Herrera Rocher. Hey, he is doing well. Welcome back to The Focus Group. John Nash in New York City live. And I'm joined by my good friend and co-host Tim Bennett in the city of brotherly love in what Don from Alabama called witness protection. <laughs> <laughs> Tim's case. I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah, Tim, you got to be up here to see what's going on. All right, so I can only imagine. Joining us on set is uh, Chef Michael Greco, and we have Kara Kenny as well. And Michael is the owner of Julietta's. Did I say that right? 100%. 13 Carmine Street here in the village. And uh, he's brought with us, he's brought to us something called Shambong, and he's also brought some food as well. But Let's start with Julietta's and how this came about, because it's an interesting New York City uh, snafu that led you to kind of come up with a signature thing, right? True, true. So unfortunately, I'm about 65 feet away from a church, and there are blue laws going back to 1932, where if you're within 200 feet of a church, you cannot have hard alcohol. You can only have beer or wine. My guess is they didn't want any gin houses in the area by the churches when they made it legal again. <laughs> and nobody was really drinking wine in 1932, and uh, beer was just more of an everyday drink. So I got kind of sucked into that, and I needed a creative way to kind of... Uh, make the people who wanted to come in for shots and so on a little bit happy. About three years before that, I discovered these while looking for new glassware. I have never heard of this. So this is this is a sh this is a shambong. And Kara, you told me that Chaluli was somehow involved in this, the so famous glass blower, Harrison right? Harrison Neal is a very um, accomplished artisan in glassware, and he actually has done work with Chaluli, and that's sort of how this all came happenstance to be is that he and three of his very esteemed and very handsome colleagues, as they describe themselves, came up yeah, with I, I, lo I love the Shambong website, by the way, and they <laughs> describe all this. So I, I showed this to my partner last night, Bob, and he, he was fascinated by it. He goes, so this is kind of funneling for the rich. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly. exactly. <laughs> not not the to, way I don't they came up with anything, it. But no. Because in college, it used to be the, you know, oh, there's Tim back. Beer bong. It's a beer bong. We don't use that word, Tim. No, no, no. What's this that? is We don't use that word. You don't word. use this as a shambong. This is a shambong because No, it's, I understand that. But that's it's what the I'm more it elite old. way to drink something. So. And I could honestly say that within the first few months of opening, I had somebody order a bottle of 2002 Don Perignon, and uh, I showed him this is kind of a humorous thing and they said let's do it and they put 
2002, Dom Perignon in there, and they funneled it right back. And I said, oh, what a waste. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you think it's a waste when someone takes a bottle that old and, and kind of like doesn't savor the, it, the taste of it? It could, it could be, but it was fun at the same time because I did one with him, so it was great. So, so it do, does it give you? Does it give you a quick? Um, so it's just typical of the what John had mentioned with funneling or the the old beer bong. So it does go down pretty quick. Yep, three minutes later, you get a very cool, heady feeling. Yeah, because the the effervescence of the bubbles makes it that much more impactful so so wow. has this been so this was a unique business challenge that you faced in the fact that you're dealing with laws that were drafted uh, in the 1800s or something the blue laws has this been a good thing for the business for the restaurant slowly but surely it's increased absolutely now people come in especially during you know certain holidays like St. Patrick's Day and so on they come in uh, like they would for any bar for a quick shot in and out so it has helped in general is um, I, I think being a restaurateur is an incredibly difficult thing. Um, I'm surprised you're even here. Most owners are usually on site all the time. It takes a bit of insanity. And, yeah, and and are you? Is it is, is it going well? Are you happy with the business? So I am. Far? I and am. is it what you wanted it to be when you set out it's as a growing, chef? It's growing into it. We're almost a year and a half uh, old now, and uh, it's growing. I, I think as it should grow, and it is a child, and it's growing like a child in in the proper direction, though. And did you select the uh, the Carmine Street area in particular? Um, did you want to be in the village? Or? I wanted to be in the village. Um, this came about through an introduction to my partner, who was the original owner of the spot before then. And we got along real well, and he was from northern Italy. And uh, because of our demeanor together and what our goals were, it wound up being a good partnership. So I knew the restrictions of moving there, but I figure I could kind of rise above them. Actually, so if we come down to eat there at Julietta's, what should what, what's our signature dish we should have? Uh, <laughs> I'm known for my homemade pastas, especially the ravioli. Uh, we do a pork asabuco ravioli with a uh, tomato reduction that's cooked in prosciutto. Wow. And uh, pear and ragotta ravioli. And uh, we, we all, all our product there is homemade every day. So at the end of the night, if we run out, we run out because we just make it fresh the next day. It's a very uh, European uh, feel. And, you know, and European philosophy and style. Sounds delicious. Zucchini blossoms, meatballs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's try let's try a shambong then while we have time to see what happens in the three minutes when we... <laughs> so the history of shambong quickly is that the four gentlemen, Randy being CEO, Alex, who is the head of BizDev, Harrison, they were buddies for a long time, football fans, and they decided that they were going to come up with a Super Bowl, not to be mistaken as a fruit bowl. <laughs> and what happened is so they came to this football party and everyone loved this Super Bowl but they were afraid to use it and at the end of the party somebody realized wait somebody's been drinking champagne out of this and that, that's a that's a big pour he's putting in there now yeah Nash that's good for you if I was there you know I'd be <laughs> loving it Wow it's a balancing you gotta, you gotta act. be careful. Yeah, yep. it's a balancing act. So for if you're watching or if you're listening on the on the audio podcast, it's a basically a beautiful champagne flute and the stem is hollow and it's been bent up so it, it looks like a pipe almost. At oh. ninety degrees. Hence the shambong. Right. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna take this off here. So which way do you do it, John? You put the big end in your mouth or the little no, end? No, little end. Oh, you want to put, I feel like I'm in chemistry class, Tim. Are it, you gonna do it, Nash? Who, who, do you want, who was chemistry in Michelo? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so how do you do this? So you um, just do this. Just funnel it right back. Cheers. Wow. Oh, come on, John. Oh, my God. <laughs> are, we no. drinking, are we drinking Prosecco or Champagne? No, Prosecco. Prosecco. I love Prosecco. We are in Italy, you know. <laughs> did you guys drink it all? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so Chef no, Michael I did. did. Are you proud? Are you Chef proud? Michael you knows go. how to do this. Oh, come on, Season John. Season professional. For gosh <laughs> sakes. Didn't you go to college? Mm -hmm. Look at him go! Oh my God! Sippy sip, sippy sip. But I was, <laughs> I was not the guy that could do oh, the funneling, stop. Tim. I was the guy that used to tap the keg. I did. I have a no bubble tap. So I'm now, off. what was interesting is when we had the dilemma of like we had beer and wine only at Julietta's. We were like, well, what can we come up with that's sort of unique? And that's how we came up with these cocktails, and they're very easy to make. And mm -hmm. it really, we had a launch last week. Was incredibly successful and we have six different that's flavors. where you're 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 not adding liquor you're you're Just flavoring natural the right, right. right right natural fruit juice and so how do you get away from the new york law because you mentioned that only beer and wine so is, this is, is champagne this is a, classified as something different it's a wine it's a, it's a wine. wine you could use fortified okay. wines like ports and um 
if he's listening, Mr. Cuomo, only you could overturn this law. So <laughs> please help out the small businesses in this world. Is it only the state can do this? It's a state law, yeah. The church really could care less whether we have it right now. It's really about the state. And uh, there is, I found out through my friends in Albany, there is a bill on his desk to overturn it. He just hasn't gotten to it yet. So what's this cost as versus me having the champagne in a straight glass? <laughs> <laughs> I leave it to Tim to go to that one, right? It's a, it's a few dollars less, definitely, by far. You know, a few to, dollars to, to less do, to and, not do the shambong. No, to do the shambong, a few dollars less. Oh, really? Yeah, because a glass pour is a little bit, a little more hefty. So, really? Yeah, we're generous here. Wow. <laughs> does does the, when you do shambong, you get to take the shambong home with you? No, no, no. But no, we, I was I was wondering about that. We do sell them retail. They do. We, uh, we're allowed to sell them retail, so we have started that process now. Tim, I'm and, still I'm still on my. And first. how much are those? Uh, for two uh, glass stemware, it's thirty-five dollars. For a set, okay. and they come yeah. in a nice box. They come in a Tim, box. Tim, we of actually two. brought a Moscow Mule one for you because I know how much you like those. So. Well, that I I, I appreciate it, and hopefully I'll get it when I'm uh, when I'm more mobile. So, are you the exclusive uh, restaurant that has mm -hmm. Chambon? Yes, we are. <laughs> you are okay. And what happens if a bunch of other people decided to do it? Did were you able to, from a marketing standpoint, get some sort of an exclusivity agreement or? Is it just you're ahead of the curve? Within the New York City market, we do have exclusivity. Correct. And also he has the ability to sell them for Shambong as well, which is great. Um, wow. Because obviously when, when guests come in it and is. they participate, it's a really unique experience. Um, and one of the reasons why the guys behind Shambong love it is because it creates a way of people to communicate. And if you go to Julietta's, one of the missions that Michael has at Julietta's is that he's throwing a party for every one of his guests. And so now this is a great way to make people communicate that normally might not have interacted. So I think it's very clever. Now, how many seat? How many seats can you have at the restaurant? Uh, we now? have about 50 seats inside, 14 around the bar, and then we have a beautiful outdoor seating terrace that seats about 18. So uh, we're right across the street from a park with the beautiful water fountain. So it really is a great environment. And I'm going to um, ask what I hope is not an, a bad question, but I'm, I'm sure you have a long-term lease on the space. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, in New York, this is one of these things where that's a real determinant. Is is and and unfortunately, we I love restaurants add character to a neighborhood and to the city, and I can't tell you how many times I've gone somewhere and it's like someone's either closed up or and it's usually because landlord says. You know, 60% increase. Who can deal with that? Right. And that's and that's another problem, which which is really affecting the restaurant industry now. Retail can't afford to go into these spots anymore, so they either wait for the big person to come in, like the Bed Bath and Beyonds of the world, or the Starbucks of the world, or yeah, they put it, yeah, yeah, or they put in a restaurant. So what happens is that the village, which was a shopping mecca in New York City, is but now small nothing, shopping, like yeah, little small boutique shopping. shops. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is now just nothing but restaurant after restaurant after restaurant. And the city is becoming over flooded because that's what the landlords think is going to work, but it actually deters people from going down to the village. It's a shame when you look at the vacancies for the retail in the village. I it, mean, it, it's sad. What was a thriving space is just, I would say, with. Well, I went down to, I had to, I watched the. one block, there's about three or four different vacancies. Oh, and, and that's not just. And go to Soho, West, yeah. West Broadway. Yeah. It's, it's horrible. I was down at, I did the uh, Waverly Cinema had, or what it's called, it's not called that now, but I it used see, to be. But the, it, it's right around a block from yeah. me, yeah. And it used, to, they had the animation shorts, the animated short films for the Oscars there. And I walked around the neighborhood for about 20 minutes because I was early and I was meeting a friend. And I was stunned by the character of the retail. A lot of e-cigarette shops, a lot of, you know, but it, yeah. gone were the little t-shirt places where you could find something unique. Um, or the little jewelry places. It was very, you know, it was TD Bank, something, something, empty, empty, empty restaurant. Yeah. So, but isn't that a problem with our bigger cities overall, yeah. is trying to get the service people to come in? Because I imagine that's another big issue you have. I know here in Philadelphia, as the city has grown and, and things have gotten more expensive, Chicago, San Francisco, Boston, it's very difficult to find some people to do a lot of the things necessary just to run a retail business or a restaurant. Yeah. Salaries aren't enough. No. Yeah, I, I agree. And then the landlords get incentives if they're closed as well. Um, there's a there's a certain I'm not I'm not going to be direct with this, but there's a certain break they get, which is why it affords them to be closed for a year or two years or three years without very little consequence. So that explains something I read in the paper the other day, where De Blasio is seeking 
to create a tax to de-incentivize an empty space. That would be brilliant. I thought it was kind of weird and heavy-handed at first, but now you've explained why that would actually exist. Um, so you're, you're loving the space, you're loving the restaurant. Especially in the spring and summer, it is gorgeous. Have you, do you tailor menu by season? Uh, I do, actually. We have our new menu coming out in about three weeks. Uh, so I change it twice. I change it once uh, the last week of September, and then the last week of April I change the menu. We are fairly new, so it's, it's a growing process, and we're learning about our clientele and our neighborhood, uh, but it seemed to work so far absolutely and we and changed and i was gonna <laughs> thank you kara yeah. i was gonna say and and shambong of yeah, course spring shambong. i'm sorry i'm all about the food you know it's like you know john, it's a bad you gonna thing take... that i'm all about alcohol what's up with that I don't are know. you gonna take me to julietta's john when i'm there in new york if you say it correctly i'm feeling better what did i say is it julietta you, you said it kind of like but it's julietta's <laughs> like, like, you americanized it is what like it is. like romeo and Juliet. julietta's <laughs> As I say in Philly, Juliet. Well, I, I wrote a phonetically. I wrote it out as Ju <laughs> like from Romeo and Juliet. I wrote, Ju but but it's Ju Juliet because it's a Juliet. We, we do have a couple of things. It is a Venetian restaurant. I uh, I took the idea from a, a number of restaurants in Italy and France and even in Berlin, a couple of French bistros, and I kind of put it together as one. But uh, Julieta is not necessarily a person. It's more of a philosophy to me. When food and wine make love to each other, you get Julieta, <laughs> and that's what it is. <laughs> And Tim. now you're a poet. And yeah, now, and, and <laughs> Tim, don't we always say you have to have something, right? You have to have your thing for you business have to, have to thing. succeed. And I think the shampoo is the perfect thing because you're, I think you're absolutely right um, to bring it back to that is that if you're going out to eat, you can go out to eat in a million different places. But if you have an experience and something that um, bonds people and memorable and you can laugh at, you're going to remember it that much more and tell 20 people about it. So congratulations. Now, Tim, if you were here... Uh, I'd have drank the whole thing in one shot. With <laughs> and you would have done far better than me. And I do Instead confess sippy, that. Sippy. Did you even drink it? All? I did. Yeah, I did. I, I loved it. And it's three minutes later, and you could see I'm a little, you know, a little looser. Um, <laughs> uh, Chef Michael also brought some incredible stuff. And I think I heard the word gnocchi. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, there's a secret to his gnocchi. So why don't you go into that? So when I created when I created the concept, uh, I wanted the food to be very feminine in style because it was Julieta with the plans of opening maybe Romeo's soon, which will be more masculine in style. So it's re it's regatta it's regatta uh, gnocchi. So it's very very soft. It kind of melts in your mouth a little bit. It's not the typical potato gnocchi that you would have. So you just answered the question I was going to ask. Normally it's made with potato. Correct. But you yeah. made it with ricotta. Yeah. Oh, they're like little pillows. Really? Yeah. So good. And it holds together. And it holds together. And and that's that's the whole idea to make yeah, sure that me. even if you have a <laughs> steak, pillows. it's feminine in style. And that's and that's the whole idea. So we have ricotta gnocchi with a very fresh tomato basil sauce. We have a um, uh, our popete, our little meatballs, which are a little bit different. Uh, it's a tribute to my friend's mother in Rome, and uh, so she cooked for me one day, and I got the idea, and we went forward with that. And then I have some. Uh, uh, Amarone, which is a very uh, heavy body wine from Verona, uh, rice balls as well, arancini. So, I love rice balls. I, Tim, I've never had one, and this is oh, this really? is a, this is a new one to me. I'm not even sure how, how did how did where did you have one, Tim? John, I've traveled the world. <laughs> <laughs> so what's interesting though is that come the spring, from witness protection, you've traveled the world. <laughs> so, but come the spring, uh, Michael's introducing a very traditional Italian way of Sunday suppers, which is called Frank's Table yep. after his grandfather. After my grandfather. So it's all family style. Two, three p.m. Uh, yeah, for probably supper. I always yeah. think of as like three, three, three to seven ish. Yeah. You know, and. Uh, and it's going to be family style where you have the choice of pasta and what sauces you want and a nice bowl of salad, a bottle of wine. And it's very, very casual in style so families could be introduced to the restaurant and enjoy and relax. Because we are in a neighborhood. You know, the West Village is a neighborhood. Oh, it's totally. And it's a very, nowadays, it's a very family neighborhood. Absolutely. Yeah. It used to be gay back in the day and the strollers moved in. I don't <laughs> mind, but. <laughs> There's not as many strollers as you think. <laughs> so All right, Tim, we got to wrap food? up. I know. Were you guys going to try food? Was that the deal? Yes, we have food here. Tim, yeah. we do miss you. So we actually have a set of these for you and for our friend John. Well, that's so that's so sweet of you. Thank you. We appreciate it. And hey, and 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 the and the um, 
in the uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Full disclosure, John. Yes. The uh, Kara Kenny and John and myself <laughs> all went to high school together, Pomparock High School, Southbury, Connecticut. Well, did, did you uh, hear? Did you hear me mention when we were talking about chemistry? I said to Kara, "Was that De Nicolos?" <laughs> you know, it's funny how that that time of your life is imprinted on you, like. Pomperog, kachunk. But to viewers <laughs> and to listeners, I want everybody to know that their class was the class clowns. Like they did yes. things that we could never get away with. <laughs> Thank you, Kara. So, That's true. And we didn't know that until years later. We're like, you did what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got away with a lot of stuff. Hey, John, since you're since you're there on set, I'll let you say goodbye so that uh, it's done correctly. So because oh. I, I think it's my 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 camera here is jumping a little bit. Well, Tim, you sounded fantastic. Thanks for joining us from Philadelphia. Thank you, Chef Michael Greco. The restaurant is Julieta's 13 Carmine Street here in the village. I do urge you to visit, order any of the food, and get a shambong as well. Thank <laughs> you, Kara, for bringing Chef Michael to us. Thanks, Deep Discount, for being a partner of ours here on The Focus Group. We appreciate it, and we love working with you guys. And thank you to VW. Check out VW.com for all the new models that they have, uh, especially we like the Atlas and the Tiguan, nice big cars. And as Tim likes to say, don't text and drive, arrive alive. See, Tim, I got that right. So we'll got see you right, next John. week. And we have food now. I hate you. <laughs>